Uh, my name is Ray Schnapp, and I'm the Wabash River Keeper. I'm going to talk about damming the White River and learning from our past mistakes. And I, um, I didn't spell it wrong. Um, I want to explain a little bit about what the Wabash River Keeper means. Um, it means I sort of signed up to be a spokesperson for our rivers, and I'm an affiliate of the Waterkeeper Alliance, which is headed up by Robert Kennedy, Jr. Um, next slide, please. I know you're all thinking that the Wabash River is way over there, and we're at the White River here, but um, my territory encompasses the entire Wabash River Basin, which includes the White River, of course, and um, this is obviously too much for any one person to handle, but it's all that area outlined in orange there is the Wabash River watershed or drainage basin. Um, and I rely a lot on individuals and groups that care about rivers in many of these sub-watersheds and stream reaches because I can't possibly cover all that territory myself. So um, in the Wabash River Valley, one of our claims to fame is that we have the longest uh, free-flowing river east of the Mississippi. And that is really a pretty um, awesome thing to be known for. Next slide, please. Um, I, I wanted to share this quote because I really like it. Um, a river is more than an amenity, it's a treasure. I think that kind of sums up my philosophy. Next. Next. Um, so I want to talk about why rivers are important, what happens when we dam them, and um, why we don't need any more dams. <clears throat> Next. So the White River is one of Indiana's um, natural and scenic rivers. It's designated as a natural and scenic river, and it's part of our water trail system. So all these um, blue marks that you see up there are already existing um, trails, which are water corridors, so people can travel from one place to another on these rivers. And they're not necessarily suitable for transportation of heavy cargo, but they are a way to get around. And certainly, they're a great recreational resource as well. Next. In addition to being transportation corridors and recreational um, areas, our rivers provide some ecosystem services that are really valuable. And I think we often tend to underestimate them. So rivers uh, provide drainage. That's why we often refer to a watershed as a drainage basin. It's uh, pretty much interchangeable terminology there. Um, and uh, so the rivers can carry the water away. And um, river systems generally include lowland, bottomland, and uh, wetlands that can store water for a while until it's needed. So they act kind of like a sponge to store some of the floodwaters that we have here, and we tend to have because we have such high precipitation. Um, and the um, wetland areas recharge our underground water supplies, also known as groundwater, um, and they act as a filter too because the water has to flow through the subsoil and the bedrock to get to the underground aquifer. Um, so that's a, a filtration kind of service. And how many in here are on wells? Are you drinking well water? Then you're sort of taking advantage of that feature. Um, and our waterways also provide important migration corridors for migrating birds and fish, as well as habitat for a number of other wildlife species. Next slide. <laughs> so what happens when we dam a river? The river kind of goes away and it becomes a lake. It's a different kind of water body entirely, though. Um, it does tend to raise the water table, which um, slows down drainage, reduces drainage. And you're going to hear more about drainage um, from some of the other speakers, I think. But um, what I want to mention is that it, Drainage is not only an issue for agricultural land, it's also an issue for 
uh, those underground water supplies that we talked about because they will be closer to the surface so they will be more vulnerable. And it's also a big issue for septic dis uh, systems because septic systems use the soil as a treatment um, media and so if the water table is too high the septic systems won't work and that is a big problem around many existing lakes. Next slide. <clears throat> So when you um, build a dam and construct a lake, almost from the first moment, uh, the lake will beginning, be beginning to accumulate sediment. Um, and many of our Indiana soils are, are um, very erodible. They're prone to erosion. And that uh, soil washes away, washes down the river. And um, it will end up behind the dam and filling up um, the, the lake itself. So almost from the beginning, uh, the formation of a lake, it's starting to fill up. And I've seen some uh, headlines about the sediment buildup in Geist Reservoir and how that is going to need to be dredged and, and cleaned out. Next slide. And the Indiana Department of Natural Resources has a program called Lake and River Enhancement that provides funds every year, more than a million dollars every year, to um, do lake enhancement mostly, and um, that is to fund two major programs. One is uh, the removal of sediment, and the other is invasive species. And these are very, uh, these are not hypothetical problems. They are very uh, commonplace, prevalent in Indiana lakes already. <clears throat> um, this is a picture of Griffey Lake when they drained it because the sediment was, uh, sediment buildup was so extreme. Next. Um, <clears throat> so um, when sediment builds up in lakes, another uh, expense that has to be taken into account is control of invasive species. Indiana lakes have a lot of problems with invasive species already. Uh, Aludea has been identified as the number one invasive species problem in the uh, southern Indiana lakes. And um, it's um, a, a growing concern. It's kind of uh, a new introduction, but it's spreading rapidly. Uh, the curly leaf pondweed is already very prevalent. In, um, it's been identified in 42 counties, including Hamilton and Madison County. And it may be in other counties where they just haven't looked yet. Um, another serious weed problem that um, is unsightly and interferes with boating and recreation. So um, these uh, problems are uh, something that you have to anticipate in, an, in, in constructing a lake because we know they're going to occur because they occur already in other lakes. and. Um, so I, I'm just trying to drive home the point that you can't just build a lake and expect it to um, sort of take care of itself. It's actually an ongoing maintenance cost kind of thing. Uh, next slide. And, and then another problem that we have in many Indiana lakes is with toxic algae. I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but blue-green algae tends to grow in lakes because of nutrient buildup. And uh, and these are some, again, headlines that have been reported recently in Indiana Lakes. Um, I, the toxic, go ahead. The toxic algae can cause a rash on your skin is one of the, the sort of minor uh, effects just from contact with the water. But um, if you would ingest some of that water, it, it's really very dangerous. And uh, there have been numerous reports of livestock and uh, dogs pets and um, wildlife dying from ingesting water that's contaminated with these algae in the summertime. And um, next, so, and finally I want to mention that dams themselves are really quite dangerous. They create a recreational hazard. Of course, all water sports come with a certain element of danger, um, but um, I wanted to share this uh, photo. 
it's sort of a riveting photo. It won the Pulitzer Prize in 2009, but this happened when someone's boat uh, motor quit on the lake in Des Moines, and their boat went over the dam. They were unable to, you know, um, paddle against the current to prevent that, and um, and then this woman was trapped out there, and the rescue workers couldn't reach her, but. It was just so happened that this guy was a construction worker working on the bridge, and he was able to save her. It was a, a pretty dramatic river rescue. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So um, why would we want to dam the White River? Why would we want to create a reservoir? Uh, the reasons that have been given for to justify it are to increase our water supply and to um, promote recreational use. Next. So I want to address each of those a little bit. Um, so the Citizens Energy Group um, has done an analysis of water needs in the Indianapolis area, and um, they list conservation as a number one and um, building a new regional reservoir is at the bottom of their list because it's so expensive. So um, I'm just sort of raising the question of why would we be thinking about the last resort so early on. Next. And Indiana has um, a water shortage plan. It was developed, uh, adopted in 2009 after several years of deliberation. So it's fairly recent. And uh, it, too, emphasizes conservation, that there are lots of places where we can conserve water. And, um, and they uh, suggest that we would use um, the reservoirs that we have that are um, for drinking water at this time. Those would be used first. And then we would go to the Corps of Engineers to try to use water from flood control reservoirs, which are not specifically for that purpose, and the natural lakes would be tapped last. And they also mention the need to maintain minimum stream flows in uh, rivers for um, aquatic life. Next. So Indiana already has quite a lot of recreational lakes. Um, and I, I just happened to find this list A to Z, and I'm sure this is not a comprehensive list. But um, at one time, there was a plan to have additional lakes in Indiana. Next slide. Um, I want to share this slide. This is kind of a historic tangent, but uh, I think it's important because it's part of our legacy. This map shows uh, the Corps of Engineers' plan for the damming all the tributaries along the Wabash River. And um, we did build some dams. There is a dam at Huntington that um, is the Roush Reservoir, and that is uh, damming up the headwaters of the Wabash itself. And then we had the Salamone and the Mississinawa Rivers dammed up there. But when they got down to Lafayette, they wanted to dam the Wildcat Creek and the Big Pine Creek, and uh, they ran into some stiff opposition. Um, <clears throat> mostly in the form of uh, a feisty woman by the name of Connie Wick. Maybe some of you remember Connie. Um, Connie educated people and um, circulated petitions and fought the Corps of Engineers. She went to Washington, pounded on the desks of the senators, and in the end, we won. We don't have Lafayette Lake. Next slide, please. And I want to show you what we do have, because we made that decision to change our minds, not build those dams. We have the best whitewater stream in Indiana, and a beautiful scenic stream with uh, sandstone cliffs. And these, these are um, uh, treasures, really. And next slide. <clears throat> that we wouldn't have if we had gone with the original plan to build more dams. So, that is, uh, uh, I'm sharing that as a little bit of an inspirational story and, and part of our legacy, that we were uh, willing to change our minds about construction of dams. And next slide. Um, and I feel like that those dams that were proposed in the um, 1800s and early 1900s were um, outdated at that time. And 
now, you know, in this country, we are taking out dams, and the Waterkeeper Alliance and American Rivers and other environmental groups are celebrating the removal of dams. So how many of you have seen this film, Damnation? Great. It's really good, isn't it? Um, so um, I think that constructing a dam to create a recreational lake is um, a 20th century idea, a, a tool that is um, not really useful for economic development anymore. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, I think that Mounds Reservoir is not really needed as a drinking water supply, and it's also not needed as a recreational lake. The White River is an important drinking water source already, and it's also an excellent recreational opportunity right now. So let's not damn it. <laughs>